While I'd been at the embarkation camp in Blackpool, my Dickey had passed away. He was 82. I'd loved him very much, but sad to say, with all this new kind of living I was doing, I never missed him very much. I was too busy missing my parents, brother and sisters. My rifle squadron returned to Shalufa a few days before Christmas, asking all us new boys for ten shillings to help them towards a party. Up until we went abroad, we were only earning fourteen shillings a week, and seven shillings of that went to my mother. Now I found myself earning three pounds and ten shillings a fortnight. I was now very friendly with four other Welsh boys. We all vowed to save up until we could all go home on leave, even not to take holidays until we saved up enough to go home. We still didn't know how long we'd be here. Our Christmas holiday went okay, if you call getting drunk a lot okay. The year before I never drank anything except pop in case my father found out. I was 18 before I started going to pubs. Nothing spectacular happened in Egypt. We were on active duty, so most of the towns, after nine months, were out of bounds. We visited Ismailia regularly in those nine months because after being in Shalufa for four months, we were sent to the camp in Ismailia. The billets were well built. Every so often we were sent to different camps doing guard duty. We did escort duty too. We patrolled bomb dumps. While we were in Ismailia, we did the honours as ceremonial guard. We protected the commanding officer of the Middle East Air Force. His name was Air Vice Marshal Saunders. He had two houseboats and a bungalow. I took him to church once after doing a 24-hour guard. He had a fantastic car. I stood to attention by the side of it, and when they approached, I saluted, so he saluted back to me. So he jumped in the passenger seat as I opened the door for his wife. With a blushing face, I had to tell him I couldn't drive. So he ended up driving me and his wife. I had a bad day the day the king got buried. I was on main gate duty in Shalufa when my Sten gun got jammed. The only way I could release it was by coaxing the round into the barrel and firing it free. For my carelessness, or so the camp commander said, I was put in the guardhouse for 14 days. I was charged on the day of the king's funeral after we'd been given 20 free cigarettes and the day off. I played football for the squadron. I played table tennis, darts and cards, mostly with the old women from the camp. The game we played most was whist. We used to have competitions. My father wrote to me at least twice a week. I must admit he never failed. They were long letters because me and Dad had so much in common. All the cricket news in the summer and all the football news in the winter. He was a devoted sports enthusiast. He followed Swansea Town and Forest Park regularly. I had four or five pen pals, all girls, my sisters, cousins, aunties, uncles, all writing to me, and I answered them all. How I managed it, I don't know. In June 1953, we'd saved enough to go home on leave. We'd saved enough for a five-week holiday. We saved the £52 to go home and come back. We had a marvellous time. The only thing was that our time home really flew, and before we knew it, we were back in Egypt with only nine months to serve of our three years. Before I left home to go back to the canal zone, I went visiting all my family. When I went to Bryn Hyfryd, that's where most of them lived, my Uncle Sam sent my Auntie Mary to the shop three doors away to get me 20 of the best cigarettes at the shop. I knew he was ill, but I didn't know that this gesture would be a goodbye gesture for the week after he passed away. I went back reluctantly. Nasser was now the leader in Egypt instead of King Farouk. I was due to be demobbed at the end of May 1954, but after my 21st birthday on April the 7th, I think it was two weeks after, we were told that our squadron was to become a field unit and we were to be sent to Bangkok or somewhere near. So me and all the boys that started together were leaving Egypt for a camp in Gloucester on the 20th of April. We were sailing on the Empire Fowey and the night before we sailed, we went to the pictures to see a film called The Sinking of the Lusitania. We arrived at our camp and we were told that we couldn't leave there for a week. We were all very disappointed. But then we were told that because we were without a squadron, we'd be demobbed a month before our three years was up. Plus, we'd be paid for that month. Then we would start our two years in the reserves. 
This meant we'd be paid £18 a month for two years. A part of my story I'd forgotten to mention. From about the end of 1952, I started writing to my mate Len Thomas's sister. She was a year younger than me, but what a smashing letter writer. Eventually, I stopped writing to all of my other pen pals because I was writing to her. We wrote pretty regularly to each other, and when I came home on leave, I took my mother, father and sister Pauline, who was seven, up to Pontypridd to visit. We also went to see Don Hook, Sid Thurlow and Sid Lewis. One lived in Abercunnan, the other in Kilvanid, and the rest in Pontypridd. We got fed up in the end. We all walked miles and miles. Back to my story now. After I'd stayed out of work for a month, enough time to spend the accumulated pay I'd received from the RAF, a grand total of £25, I decided to look for a job. The management was closing down so they were not re-employing anyone. I finally got a job in Convelling Press. I started working in the press shop and one of the first blokes I got friendly with turned out to be one of the best friends I ever had in my life. His name was Ray Porter. Whatever shifts we worked, I used to call for him. He lived on Carmarthen Road on my way to work. He had just got married and his wife Jean had had their first baby, a boy named Philip. He also had an Alsatian dog named Prince, who he spoiled as much as his baby. I never really liked working in Convelling. We'd start at the beginning of the shift and were never really allowed to stop until it was time to go home. We'd have a break, break for breakfast or dinner, but there were no tea breaks or brief spells to relax. My pay was about £6.10 shillings when I started, and that wasn't very good money for top bonus. Four months later, my sister Beryl married Derek. We were then very good friends and used to go out to have a drink together. Beryl's friend Shirley and her boyfriend Tommy would also be with us. We played darts and really enjoyed it. I played football for Convelling Press. We weren't a very good side that had more than our fair share of losses. We had a few celebrity matches. Two of them were against Stan Stennett, the comedian side. He was playing for the Empire Theatre while he was in pantomime there. One of the other players who worked with us, Jackie O'Driscoll, was also a good friend. He was an Irish international and Swansea Town player. He had been forced to finish his football career through breaking his leg. Sometime in 1955, I had a letter from Jean in pont de -Prith. She was going either to the Grand or the Empire Theatre with her works. She wanted me to meet her and her sister to show them which way to go. I met the bus and took them up to my mother's for dinner. My mother said after, Jean likes you because she laughed at all your dull jokes. We went to the Empire and they couldn't find their workmates, so we went to the Grand and they were given smashing seats. When they met the girls from work later, they found that they went to the wrong pantomime. After I left them, I went to play football at Paradise Park in Townhill. Then Derek came with me after tea to meet them and take them to their bus. I must say, I had taken a fancy to Jean and I mentioned it to Derek, so he prompted me to write and tell her so, which I did. She invited me up to her place to go to a dance. I went and enjoyed. From then on, it was either Jean coming to Swansea or me going to pont de Then my father fancied buying a television, so we rented one. It cost 10 shillings a week, so the three of us went shares. And we had it off of Mr Roberts, who had a radio shop in Humphrey Street in Swansea. Dad knew him because he was originally from Forest Vach. 